Well, where we stand now, Emily, is it looks like we are not heading towards a trade deal with the European Union. Now, those talks broke up just under an hour ago. Uh, they went on for three hours. And as you say, they have set Sunday for a deadline. So what that means is that David Frost, the UK's chief negotiator, he will resume those talks with Michel Barnier. But I have to say, listen to this sort of language from a number 10 source. Very large gaps remain between the two sides, and it's still unclear whether they can be uh, bridged. Talking about how the Prime Minister doesn't want to leave any route to a possible deal untested. So he wants to give it uh, one last go. Talking around the system, I'm hearing uh, language like, well, it went well enough to continue the talks. If it had gone disastrously badly, they would not have continued. But ultimately, I'm hearing they're saying we've got to be realistic about are we really going to get there, saying that it's going to be a tricky few days and they're absolutely not certain that they will give there. Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president, she has tweeted, we understand each other's positions. They remain far apart. And do we know the actual sticking points? Can you sort of spell them out for us in layman's terms? Well, as I understand it, Boris Johnson uh, went to Brussels with two thoughts in his mind. Firstly, he wanted Ursula von der Leyen to sort of act as an honest broker between Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron, who clearly have very different views on this. And the issue that he was particularly concerned about is the level playing field. This is, can you sort of agree how you will abide by common standards? And as I understand it, what he was going to say to the Commission President is you need to wind the clock back 10 days because the UK view is that they were in the right place on that. They had about 85% of a deal 10 days ago and then what happened they say and this was reported in the Times on Saturday is Michel Barnier was in self-isolation a key aide to Ursula von der Leyen who used to work with Michel Barnier was put into the talks got them into that right place mm -hmm. Michel Barnier came back and they say he didn't like it and he moved it to a different position so the two positions the position that the UK was happy with was what is called a non-regression agreement that means that the UK would say we will not lower the current standards on labour law on environmental standards where we are now. The problem was they say that the position then hardened to something much closer to, to, towards something called dynamic alignment, which would mean that as the EU changes laws, we would have to go with them. Right. Prime Minister talked about this in the Commons. If we didn't, they would punish us. And there was talk about how the EU was asking for us to agree to a tariff schedule. You do this, this tariff will be imposed. And what we were looking for was something much more akin to a sort of a joint uh, dispute mechanism. We know the talks only broke up in the last sort of 10, 15 minutes or so, Nick. So it's probably too early to get full reaction. But how is this going to affect play politics at Westminster? Well, obviously, there is still a chance of a deal, but at the moment it's looking more like no deal. And it was interesting today that Keir Starmer, who's been pretty silent on Brexit, he did talk, he mentioned it at Prime Minister's questions, because he could potentially see no deal. And that is an attack line. He can attack the Prime Minister, use his own language. This is, as the Prime Minister said, a failure of statecraft. For the Conservative Party and for Brexiteers, the Brexiteers would like a deal, but it has to be a deal as it was 10 days ago. So they will be happy if the Prime Minister says uh, the EU is not expecting UK sovereignty and uh, therefore it is going to be no deal. It's interesting, some of the hardline Brexiteers, they were already talking about if the Prime Minister did breach those red lines, they were already talking about tactics and they'd alerted Number 10 about how they might rebel. Interestingly, the Prime Minister, he's kept very strong lines open to the veteran Brexiteers. They've had much more confidence in him and it was interesting. He had quite a helpful question, him, a question teeing him up at Prime Minister's questions from the veteran Brexiteers. Edward Lee. Um, when I was a spear carrier in the uh, Brexit referendum, that campaign led by my right honourable friend, we assured the British people that a trade deal was entirely achievable. So can I urge my right honourable friend to make one last effort? And surely that deal is achievable because we have no intention of lowering our standards. But the EU should know this, that if consistent with national security, he cannot secure that deal for us. This parliamentary party will back him to the hilt because strength comes with unity. Yeah. Yeah. 
Edward Lee, at uh, Prime Minister's questions this lunchtime, well, let's speak now to the Labour frontbencher Jonathan Reynolds, the Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, and Conservative MP and longtime Brexiteer John Barron. We're also joined by Marie Clapeau, who is a member of the French National Assembly for President Macron's En Marche party. And Marie, I'm going to start with you, if that's OK. It, it is pretty gloomy news here. Um, wh what is the sense where you are in France tonight? I think we've just lost uh, Murray, so I'm going to uh, come back when we've got that line up. Um, John Barron, can I go to you then? D have you heard anything tonight that has made you less happy? No, um, I think the important thing is that uh, we must remember that a trade deal is for keeps, not just for Christmas. And uh, I think the Prime Minister des uh, deserves praise for standing firm and not allowing fudge and compromise uh, we may later regret just to get a deal over the line. So I've heard nothing to suggest he's going to do that. So as we stand at the moment, we all want a deal, but it has to be a good deal because, uh, as we've said many times before, uh, no deal is better than a bad deal. Uh, do you want a deal? I mean, just to, to, to understand that, has Boris Johnson given you direct reassurances that the ERG uh, and the veteran Brexiteers will be well looked after? Well, I'm not a member of the ERG, but he has given me personal assurances that we're going to stand firm. He knows that we must honour our election pledge, said in the made clear in the manifesto that we want a clean break. And Brexit makes no sense if you think about it. If we leave and then have to sign up to a myriad of EU rules and regulations without even perhaps sitting at the top table. So just, just to so, clarify, a, a clean break for you is, is leaving without any kind of deal with the EU? No, no, not at all. A clean break means we retain our sovereignty, we make our own rules and regulations, we maintain good standards, and if anything, we've increased those standards. If you think about it, we've now banned the export of live animals. We couldn't do that when we were in the EU. But it doesn't stop a good trade deal if there's willingness on both sides. After all, the logic of Brexit, if you think about it, is that the EU has a poor record of making trade deals around the world. It doesn't have a trade deal with China or or uh, the US or India. We want trade deals around the world, including... Well, we also presumably EU, want to, to trade with our largest um, trading body, which is the EU. Let, let me just bring in Jonathan Reynolds. When people like John Barron talk about sovereignty, is that important to Labour? Well, I think it's frankly awful from the Conservative Party to, at this stage, be talking about no deal even being preferable. They promised the British people a deal. Of course Brexit means there are more decisions, powers that come back to the UK because we're not sharing sovereignty with the rest of the European Union. But let's be clear, there was never any doubt that the promise to the British people was that there would be a trade deal. Quite frankly, there should be one already. This is not an ambitious deal that the government is seeking. Let's go back to the original aspiration for a best-in-class trade deal. There was talk of replicating access for services to the single market, the passporting regulations, which are a feature of the European Union. All of that is gone. All we're talking about now is trying to avoid tariffs on goods at the border. And there's still a whole range of, of checks that have to be in place, uh, customs checks, a whole range of bureaucracy. The fact that the government cannot even have that in place by now is a disgrace. But to be talking at this stage about no deal, frankly not good enough. They've got to get on and deliver this and focus on rebuilding the economy after the pandemic. Why don't those tariffs um, worry you, John Barron? I mean, when you've got the NFU telling us of the catastrophic damage, for example, to British agriculture, tariffs of 85%. I mean, high tariffs are high prices on our food. Why doesn't that matter to Conservatives? Well, of course, it, uh, I mean, let's, it's a false premise. I don't recognise what you say for this reason. I mean, it's very straightforward. In, inward investment and jobs depend in aggregate on things like corporation, low corporation tax, labour market flexibility, English language, if you like, good universities. Those in aggregate are more important than average t tariffs of, say, 3, 5, 7 per cent on WT. I don't think most people care about low corporation tax in this country as much as they care about being able to buy food. But, but the, we could have food prices fall because if, once we leave the EU, we won't be imposing the tariffs that the EU imposes on foodstuffs going into the EU. So actually, it could go both ways. And I think it actually will get lower food prices as a result. But we must remember the litmus test in all of this is we've been talking about is there going to be a deal or not? 
But in the full knowledge that there could be no deal, we've seen a record amount of inward investment into the UK, twice the level of France and Germany in recent years since Brexit. Very briefly, can you respond to that, Jonathan Reynolds, and then I'll bring in Murray. I mean, completely untrue. If you, if you take what John has just said there, there'd be no logic for Brexit either if you're starting to say that tariffs make no difference and trade deals make no difference. The fact is inward investment has fallen significantly into the UK since Brexit. The, the flow of inward investment has gone down significantly. The stock, which is the value inward investment, still holds up very high because we've always been open to that. But there are serious problems. This programme has covered them yesterday. The food impact, the bureaucracy impact, what it means for British people travelling abroad, trying to do business or just going for leisure. These are serious issues the Conservative Party like this still not engaging with the reality they've got to deliver this deal because that's what they promised and that's what people quite reasonably expect let me bring in Mireille Clapeau if I can sorry that we lost you before uh, when you hear uh, John Barron a Conservative MP sounding quite bullish about whatever happens next uh, even a no deal uh, a clean break um, what is the sense where you are tonight Mireille Clapeau well um, what I can say um, I heard um um, somebody saying that uh, strength comes from unity and uh, the European Union is uh, really uh, united. And um, I'm afraid that uh, maybe uh, the British Prime Minister uh, underestimated the determination of the European Union. So if uh, there will be no deal, there will be uh, no deal. Uh, it will be a pity for uh, both uh, the United Kingdom and the European Union but uh, it's, uh, it's time now to come to a compromise and to make com some concessions. Well, from because what we're on hearing... The start, January, the, anyway, uh, it will be Brexit. Th this this, this um, concept of compromise is confusing us tonight because it sounds, from what our political editor said, was that two weeks ago the level playing field had been agreed. It was a non-regression agreement. And then the EU started moving that and started to demand that Britain entered a dynamic alignment, which means if EU wants to change, we have to change too. You can see why that would push negotiations backwards. Well, a negotiation uh, is uh, made of uh, concessions. Um, well, I don't have the details on this precise thing, but we know that there are still some gaps gaps on fishing, gaps on the uh, conditions of uh, fair competition and uh, gaps on governance. So uh, I trust the negotiators uh, to find uh, the right uh, compromise at the end of the day. John. But uh, it's true that um, we are maybe uh, losing uh, our patience because the time uh, is going and uh, nothing is happening. John Barron, is, is there any concession that you think Boris Johnson should be making this evening that clearly hasn't been made? Well, in any negotiation, there's going to be an element of concession. Well, we saw that, that element, just to pin that down. Yeah. Well, I think what he's got to do is stand firm on this issue of sovereignty. There is no point leaving the EU if we then sign up to their future rules and regulations. That's not sovereignty. With, with respect, I didn't ask where he should stand firm. I asked where the elements of concession were that you mentioned. Where should he give ground? Well, I think... It, the fishing issue is something that, as I understand, we are in lockstep. The government is in lockstep with our own commercial fishing organisations. Even if we got 100% access to our waters uh, tomorrow, we don't have the size of fleet because of the common fisheries policy. We don't have the size of fleet. So maybe there's a little bit of ground there whilst we had take time to build up our the size of our fleet and fish our waters. But the sovereignty of our waters, the sovereignty of our position in not abiding by EU rules and regulations is absolutely paramount. I hope we get a deal, but it's got to be a good deal on equal terms. Where would Labour make those concessions, Jonathan? Look, if, if what we read in the press is true about the negotiations, fishing, the level playing field, and how alignment is handled in future have been the issues for around about four years. There's nothing new. I think it suits both sides to perhaps suggest things are further apart than they really should be. There will need to be some sort of arbitration mechanism for where things differ in future. We're not going to sign up to rules we get no say under. I think that's fairly obvious. There'll be a, there's mostly in, in trade agreements there's some sort of non-regression clause and for us on the labour side we wouldn't want to cut labour standards environmental standards so I think that's relatively easy to to go forward on uh, if these are the issues if that if those reports are correct I think they're probably closer together than people think and Keir Starmer said today that he would uh, vote in the national interest was his line 
it's fair to say you're minded to vote for any deal that comes back at this point because it's better than no deal, right? Well, we've always been consistent in warning about what no deal means. And if you study it, if you look at it, no deal it is clearly an absolute nightmare scenario for most people in the UK. Now, obviously, we want to see the deal. I think that's a reasonable caveat to, to put on that. I would also say it will be the government itself which owns this deal it's negotiated. You know, they're the government of the day. They're effectively a vote leave government. Well, if you vote with it, then you have to own it. But if the alternative is no deal, I think people understand that's the decision that's being made. There is no other position at this stage other than voting for the deal which it was, comes forward or no deal. As Let, let's try and get inside um, the EU leaders' minds at this point. Uh, Murray, you're close to President Macron. Where is his head now? Is he? Would you expect him to be meeting Boris Johnson this weekend? Well, <laughs> I'm not aware of um, uh, President Macron's uh, agenda. Um, I know that he has uh, some important ap appointment about uh, uh, climate. Uh, well, we don't, you know, um, the, the future of the European Union uh, is at stake, and President Macron is uh, very much involved in the future of the um, European Union. So maybe um, he can both uh, either judge that uh, it's uh, a very important topic. Uh, he may say that anyway, uh, we are too close now to the 1st of January, so it's, uh, it's uh, no use to spend more time. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.